Thank you so much, Professor Yomtov, whose work I remember reading early in my own career. So it's a pleasure to have been introduced by you. I also had the pleasure of working with, with Amots for many years, met him 35 years ago. And once we load, I will be here to convince you that birds can save the world. Yes, so it's a huge pleasure, a huge honor uh, to be here in front of this uh, amazing group and to be in this absolutely amazing country about which, of course, I've spent my life uh, learning about and reading about and uh, knowing so many colleagues, including Yossi, for many years. And this is my first visit to your country, and it has been extremely moving, and I'm very, very grateful and honored to all of you for inviting me. And I want to honor, as all others have this morning, the uh, memory and the work of this amazing individual whom uh, I've known for, as I said, 30, more than 30 years. Uh, I speak on behalf of the thousands of scientists and conservationists around the world who uh, have known of this man and his work, uh, and the many, many hundreds who have argued with him, vehemently argued with him for uh, sometimes hours into the night. Uh, he's affected many of our most important thoughts in animal behavior. Uh, and uh, indeed, he's honored your country uh, extremely well in science and will for all time. Now, no. I also want to pay great thanks to all the many friends that I've had, uh, Israeli friends and colleagues I've had for my career, but in particular, thank the many new friends that I've met uh, over these last few days seeing your country. Uh, I appreciate all the time and energy that you've put into uh, to teaching me so much about, uh, uh, about Israel. Everybody in this room knows that Earth is at a major turning point, at a cusp in its history. Right now, birds like this spoon-billed sandpiper are per perched at the very edge of existence. And I will have a hypothesis is it possible that human cultures can eventually coexist over the long term, side by side with intact natural systems? Certainly, Amot Sahavi believed this to be the case. And if it's true, if it's going to be true, it's going to have to be that every culture and every generation embraces the idea, number one, and number two, we need to have something that acts as a proxy, that acts as a measure for how we're doing, whether we're getting closer and, clo or, and closer to this ideal. And it's my firm belief that birds represent both of these very important powers. The power of birds is unrivaled in the world. Number one, for centuries they have been superb models for how nature works. This was one of Amatsa's uh, life beliefs. They teach us things about the fundamental operations of the world. But they are also extremely sensitive indicators of environmental change. They are because they migrate by the billions, north to south, twice each year. They are the heartbeat of the Earth's natural cycles. And perhaps most important, uh, and deep in the hearts of every one of you here in this room, they are nature's most effective voice to us. And all of these powers give us the opportunity to use birds to save the world. I want to illustrate one point about birds. You don't need to know anything about them at all to appreciate them, to enjoy them. Everybody enjoys birds. Let's see if I can make this work. This is one sound from our very large library of natural sounds. how privileged we are to walk through the woods and hear music, jazz, coming out of the woods. 
You don't need to know anything about birds to enjoy the fact that they exist. Let me tell you what you're hearing here. This is one of the birds that the Polynesian emperors decorated their robes with when they arrived on the Hawaiian Islands 1,500 years ago. It's an o'o. And by the turn of the 20th century, four of the five o'os of Hawaii had gone extinct. There was leaving one that lived in the 20th century. That's the Kauai o'o. You just heard the last o'o. And in fact, you are hearing indeed the last o'o. This is a bird that was rediscovered, one individual, and recorded and this bird was singing, looking for the mate, because they would typically duet. So this is the one bird singing for its mate that it would never see. Let's hear it again now, now that you know what it is. <whistles> Waiting for the mate. The difference, the difference between hearing it first and saying how lovely that sound is, and hearing it now, knowing it's the last individual of its kind, that difference in your heart is one of the great powers of birds. They move us in ways that little else in nature does. And sadly, we're continuing to be moved by birds such as this, Apparently, the uh, first of the curlews in the Eastern Hemisphere, the Old World, to have gone extinct. It appears that you've lost one of your curlews on this side of the Atlantic. And of course, as you might know, some years ago, we lost our version of the same bird, the Eskimo curlew, in the Western Hemisphere. So both hemispheres of the world have now lost a curlew. We lost our curlew during the days in which it was called the prairie pigeon. It used to migrate in enormous flocks like pigeons. And it was taken, every last one of them was taken by market hunters to sell for food. And they called it prairie pigeon because in the prairies of North America, it reminded those hunters of this bird, the most abundant bird that has ever lived on earth. Five billion of these birds would migrate each year, north and south, and we took every last one of them. We took them all for food. And when the market hunters finished the pigeon, they moved to the prairie pigeon and took the curlews. And here is a picture of one of these proud groups of market hunters with the very last of the passenger pigeons taken in the late 1880s. That's the only picture that I know of, of passenger pigeons for sale. Now, we know that in this side of the world and in other parts of the world, this kind of activity is still going on today for the purpose of producing food. And I'm here in part to pay homage and thanks to the champions of the flyway and to the Society for the Protection of Nature in Israel for the work that you are doing converting the idea of cultures around the world from thinking about birds as food to thinking about birds as creatures that we share this world with. So thank you for the work that you're doing. My question is, how could we do this? How could we take five billion birds down to zero in the course of only a few decades. Supposing we'd had a gas gauge, supposing we'd had a fuel indicator where we'd see, what well, there's only, we're only half full now. What, we're down to only a quarter of as many pigeons as there used to be. Maybe we should stop and let them rebuild the population. You don't take your gas tank down to zero, if we had a fuel gauge that allowed us to see them moving north and south and measure them every year, maybe we would have avoided doing this terrible thing. Today, we still have issues that are making us ask the same question in different ways. This is a story 
of the enormous migratory pathways of the bar-tailed godwit, which spends its winters in the southern parts of the Pacific, breeds up in the far north of Siberia and Alaska, and some of them make this non-stop flight all the way down to New Zealand, the longest single flights of any bird. On their return route, these birds all stop right there on the coast of China uh, in uh, the Yellow Sea where they refill their own gas tanks by feeding in these mud flats and they do so by the tens of thousands still today reminding us of the passenger pigeons and the prairie pigeons. But this picture is very ominous. Perhaps you've seen it before. That cloud that you see at the very top there, that's not a cloud. This is the full picture that you're seeing there. The mud flats, the tidal flats of the Yellow Sea are systematically being filled in to turn them into commercial real estate. As a consequence, little by little, all the places that 60 species of shorebirds depend upon and have for millions of years, all of these places are being used up. Are we looking at passenger pigeon again? Have we learned to stop? Can we measure our, our effects? This is the hypothesis. Now, all news about birds is not bad. I want to assure you that there's plenty of good news out there, as you yourselves know, as Israelis. This is a story from eastern part of Maui in the Hawaiian Islands, which underneath that cloud have enormous forests, very wet forests filled with moss and ferns. And underneath that forest are several species of native birds that were believed to be extinct, then rediscovered in the 1960s. And as a consequence of their rediscovery, people came together, all manner of people, small landowners, the governments of various sizes, watershed groups, to form the East Maui Watershed Partnership. Today, the entire slopes of eastern Maui are protected. Why? Because of the power of birds. We've learned, we change our behavior, and the birds can survive. And this story has been repeated a number of times in the Western Hemisphere. Perhaps the most famous one is that of the peregrine falcon, which for a period of time looked like it would disappear entirely from uh, all but the extreme northern parts of North America as a result of our discovering why it was declining, changing our behavior, and simply doing a little help with the falcon, the populations of peregrine falcons steadily and rapidly recovered. You can see in these graphs populations in California, migrant birds in Cape May steadily increasing their populations, and the bird was taken off of our endangered species list already 20 years ago. If we change our behavior, the birds will respond. A very simple, very powerful message about nature. So my question today, my main point today is, what about all the birds that are not on the endangered species list? The birds that are simply common out there in the forests and fields of our habitats, what are they telling us? And unfortunately, many of them are telling us stories like this wood thrush from eastern North America, stories of steady cumulative population decline. The story of the wood thrush is a mystery that's only beginning to be solved, but it is one of the most common birds in eastern forests of North America, and yet every single year it gets less and less common. And this is the case with a number of different species, whether they're forest birds or bog breeding birds, or in the case of meadowlarks, the, the uh, grassland birds, Many of our species in North America are declining, and we have the opportunity to listen to them the way we listened to the peregrine falcon and learn what's going wrong so that we, in time, to keep them from joining the ranks of passenger pigeon and kawaii o'o. -oh. The most rapidly declining bird in all of North America is a common backyard woodpecker, the northern flicker which is declining over essentially its entire range. And one of the big reasons for its decline is the fact that human beings hate dead trees. 
So we keep taking the dead trees away from our forests and our lawns and our, and our parks. Uh, and the flicker is a bird that depends on dead trees. Woodpeckers, after all, all together are a group that depend on the fact that trees die. And the woodpeckers live as a result of that. The idea that in nature there's a cycling, that there is a repeated cycling of dis disturbances has really become an important idea in ecology and it's beginning to be understood by conservation. And I'm going to tell you a brief story having to do with our birds, the birds that Amot Sahavi saw in the early 1970s that changed his behavior. The story that I'm telling you uh, has to do with this form of disturbance, that is, of course, natural lightning, which uh, in the places around the world where it occurs, it often results in fire, which is a natural event in uh, many, most habitats around the world. Uh, here's a map of lightning strike frequencies in the United States, and our story today focuses on the peninsula of Florida, which is the lightning capital of North America. In that area, 50 ground flashes per square kilometer per year cause fire and have resulted in vegetation formations that are unique to the peninsula that are tolerant of repeated fire. And the star of one of these major habitats is this beautiful jay, restricted entirely to the peninsula of Florida. And you can see what's happening to the numbers of Florida scrub jays through the years. When we first began studying them back in the 70s, there were probably 50,000 birds in the state. Today, there are fewer than 5,000 birds left across the entire range of the species. And we've studied these birds for now very close to 50 years at the Archbold Biological Station uh, in South Central Florida, where out there in the middle of the scrub, this low open zone, that's prime habitat for the Florida scrub jay. And it's a bird that we can study very closely because it's a bird that we are able to tame very, very conveniently with just a few bits of peanuts. And I didn't have the picture that I really wanted here, so that's the best I could do, Arnon. Uh, for telling the group here that you've spent your own time uh, watching this bird back earlier in your career. Um, you weren't wearing a, a girl's blouse, but... Uh... So when we study these birds, we've, de we've determined that they live in territories. This is the building that you just saw, uh, and that's that scrub, and every one of these polygons is a territory of Florida scrub jays. So you can see they're packed in all the way through there, and what we began noticing in these territories, by the way, there's one pair that lives and they live cooperatively, much in the way that the Arabian babblers do here in Israel. And we determined uh, during the middle parts of our study, earlier in our study, that one of the most important populations we were watching was steadily going down, just the same way that other populations around the state had been declining. And we made a hypothesis in 1990 we decided that this possibly was a consequence of habitat protection in the form of suppressing fire. So we said, let's do an experiment. Let's burn it. Let's, let's test the idea that this habitat and its bird actually depend upon fire to stay healthy. And lo and behold, what we determined was exactly that. And here's one of the answers to the question of why we study birds for decades at a time. Because in fact, cycles in nature sometimes re are, uh, occur across many decades. We can only understand that by studying them over a long period of time. We're still studying the same population. What do you think we did when it got down to this point uh, in, in 2010? Burn it again. We did, indeed. What we had hypothesized is this period, this period of optimal conditions is about 10 years long. And look at the curve. It's, it's the same curve that we've been seeing there. So we hypothesize if we burn it again, we should see the same response if we really do understand what's going on out there. Uh, and so we burned it in June of 2010. And indeed, the population is now in the process of recovering just as it had before. So we now are, we have asked the birds 
to tell us how frequently we should be burning that particular habitat. Those birds are literally indicating to us what they need to survive. If we mimic nature and give that to them, they will survive, they will uh, go on uh, living. And this story repeats itself across the flowers and the arthropods, the spiders, everything out in this habitat has the same story, one way or another. They require fire in order to be able to persist. Fire is a natural thing. And so we are now talking with managers of land, uh, land, protected land all across the southeastern uh, United States. Burn it and they will live. Fire is not a bad thing. It's a natural and required thing. So the scrub jay represents a fine indicator for a specific thing that's needed to keep the habitat healthy. And here's the big point. Birds all together, all around the world, are outstanding indicator species. In the case of North American prairies, we have meadowlarks, we have prairie chickens. In the case of the Negev Desert, you have McQueen's bustards and other species that absolutely depend on the unique features of that habitat. Measure the populations of bustards, they will tell you how you're doing at managing that habitat. And here's the point. How do we measure so many different bird populations? We can't possibly hire that many graduate students to go do that. The answer, of course, and you all know this already, is that you're doing it. You are among the hugest armies in the world. In the case of the United States, as a consequence of many years, every five years, surveys of how Americans spend their leisure time outdoors, the answer is repeatedly, including the very most recent one, about a third of North American adults enjoy watching birds. About one out of three. Look at the size of that army. You're part of the army here in Israel. You're contributing in the same way that more and more individuals are in North America. And this really is the functional reason why there is a Cornell Laboratory of Ornithology, a place for the study and training, a place for conservation and communication, and most interestingly and importantly for today's talk, a place in which we are studying the process of using citizens to conduct science. And that's what I'll talk about for the rest of this, uh, this uh, brief presentation. The first thing we did was with the advent of the internet, we said to ourselves in our mission internally, the internet is exactly what we needed. They invented it for us. They didn't know that, but they invented it for us. The first experiment we made was put, just simply putting live TV out there. I hardly need to tell this audience the importance of live TV and barn owls we learned, we biologists learned, for example, that uh, barn owls do it every night. Every night. Many times each night. I know that you've learned this over here in Israel too. Israeli barn owls have the same habit. Uh, and of course, uh, every time they come in, they show the, the fact that they love it. And again, I hardly need to tell uh, this audience the importance of communicating to the general public uh, about birds and bird behavior and the, uh, the possibilities that they bring for peace across the landscapes uh, just by simply learning and understanding that they know no boundaries. Well, one of our first experiments was to ask the question, could we develop an atlas of, bird, of breeding birds uh, using citizens? And in the late 1990s, we did exactly that with this declining species, and, and we did discover that citizens could tell us every single known breeding spot for this rare warbler. So as the internet became uh, into being, we invented this next experiment, which continues today, the great backyard bird count, once a year, one weekend a year in the middle of February, asking people to watch birds, even if only for 15 minutes, tell us over the internet what you see, and the great backyard bird count went global just a few years ago, and its uh, numbers continue to go up. I'll just, and, and uh, last year, uh, this, this last February, um, more, almost two-thirds of the world's bird species were counted on that one weekend of the year. 
And the key message is, here's one example of a bird that you know well here in Israel, the Eurasian collared dove. In North America, it arrived in the late 1980s. And look at this series of images from each year from the Great Backyard Bird Count only. One weekend, these are the maps that show the spread of the Eurasian collared dove across North America. So that over the last few years, it's now up there in Alaska. It's across the entire southern and western uh, United States. And these maps are just from a single weekend. And my, most, my important point here is not about the biology of the dove, although it's an extremely interesting story. The real point is, look at how much information is in these maps from one weekend and one species. Imagine the idea that we did, could do that for all species and all weekends. I just want to add uh, that here, this picture is from this year, and in interestingly, the range of the Eurasian collared dove now across North America is actually larger than it has ever been in its history uh, in its original uh, context here in the old world. A very fascinating story. I did look at how the Israel Great Backyard Bird Count uh, uh, did in terms of Eurasian collar doves, and it struck me that maybe this next year we'll fill in a few more points because I dare say there are a few more places to check. So I encourage you to encourage your friends to participate next February. The most important point is that we started with the Great Backyard Bird Count was a success. It told us that we could use the internet to invite people to put their observations into the internet and store them. And so we invented this uh, ultimately global uh, process for gathering data, for archiving it, our commitment to the world is we will archive this data forever. Every time you put a bird into eBird, it will be archived in the base forever. Uh, to analyze it, we have a growing team of statisticians at Cornell, but we also have colleagues all over the world who are using the data. The data are open for everybody to use. Uh, and finally, to apply these data for real, on-the-ground, local conservation uh, applications. Uh, and so I want to just give you a few uh, points about what we've begun to learn from eBird. First of all, it's a very, very convenient personal tool for you bird watchers, for us bird watchers. This just shows you what I did with sparrows in my uh, backyard to look at how they come and go through the annual cycle, other populations come and go. Uh, one can ask questions as I did before coming here to Israel. I said, I wonder if there's a chance I could see Lichtenstein's sand grouse. I popped into eBird and discovered that the answer was no, because they're only down by a lot. And so next trip, I have a goal for the next trip. Uh, but one can actually look into eBird and make sure that the person who put the record in there actually was looking at Lichtenstein's, because those who want to can put the photograph into eBird checklist themselves. One can use it to plan your trips, as I was doing before coming here. Uh, one can pop in and look for the hot spots, the hot spots within, for example, uh, the region of Israel. These little dots that are colored show you uh, the better, the, the, the oranger the color, the more species there. Uh, let's go into one, the Hula Valley Nature uh, Reserve, where we, near where we were birding uh, up in the northern part of Israel, and you can just open this up and uh, it conducts a bar chart for you. You're gonna go there in December and you can see what you could expect to see uh, during that month. You can do this for every spot in the world at this point. So it's a tool for bird watching. But as the rest of my talk will present, that's only the beginning of what eBird represents. Remember, we're asking birds to save the world. <laughs> By the way, not all records are as believable as, uh, as most. Uh, and so we have a variety of tools within eBird to uh, notice uh, records that uh, have to be checked with the original uh, person submitting. Uh, we have now more than 1,500 regional experts all over the world who connect with somebody reporting a dog bird and help them realize that what they were actually seeing was a cat bird. The most important part of this, besides checking and correcting some of the uh, most obvious mistakes is that participants 
every time this happens, participants are learning and being better. And we have actually measured the fact that participants get better and better and better at being a bird watcher as they submit more information into eBird. I'm happy to report that eBird continues to uh, be on an exponential growth. We're now looking at between uh, 500,000 and 800,000 checklists per month submitted into the database. The consequence of that amount of data cannot be overplayed, cannot be overestimated. This is a map of our first year that we went global with an eBird uh, protocol, 2010. Uh, this is the 2017 uh, plot of eBird uh, data points. As you can see, we're beginning to see the shape of the planet uh, represented by points within the eBird database. And this gives us enormous hope for my original hypothesis that we have uh, the possibility of having a real-time indicator for how we're doing. More than 30 million hours have now been uh, represented in the database that uh, eBird includes, and this now puts us uh, directly in uh, harmony with the exploding area of big data science, where we can combine eBird data with data on land cover, with weather, uh, and with satellite uh, information through a bunch of statistical algorithms to create real-time plots of where the birds are every day of the year. And so the most important thing I can say in, in a way about the first round of discovery is that in all of your bird books, all bird books for all time have always shown bird distributions in this way. This is one particular warbler from southeastern North America. And there's its distribution as represented by bird books. I call this the blob. It's a big blob. And that's all you ever see. You see different shaped blobs, but that's the distribution that you see in bird books for this bird. I'm now going to reveal to you what the actual breeding distribution of prothonotary warbler looks like eBird data combined with the landscape data that allow us to model its presence and absence show us how deeply interesting and heterogeneous the distributions of a common bird actually are. And if we're thinking about how to conserve birds, this is what we need to know, not the blobs. So getting to the accuracy level that we can get like this, is clearly the first step towards doing comprehensive conservation at global scales. And now, imagine the idea that we can do this for every week of the year of a bird's annual cycle. Here's a common Eastern North American warbler, the Magnolia warbler, wintering in a very tiny range in the Yucatan Peninsula. And you'll now see, in May, it beginning to go up to this vast eastern North American breeding zone. The brighter areas show you the places where it's most abundant. You can see almost five individuals on an average hour of bird watching uh, in eastern Canada. And then in August, the bird is beginning to migrate back south. Notice, as is typical of most birds in North America, the slower drifting of southward, but down back down by November, it's back down to its wintering zone in the tropics. Information like this allows us to get into the details of the life cycle of a species for the very first time. We can look at the densest places where it's breeding, the densest places where it's wintering, the densest places where it's using in the migratory system, migratory period. We can do this not only for one species, we can ask the question for a whole community assemblage of species as we've done here for 20 species of Eastern North American birds. Uh, that winter in the uh, Central American tropics. And there are the dates, March, they begin to move north. And here, now we're looking at 20 different species. The brightest areas here have up to 20 overlapping individuals within the forest of that area. And so we can actually look at the community level. Here they come in October, beginning to move back down south. And finally, that whole community ends up wintering down here in this relatively tiny part of the world.
we can then put that together and ask questions. Okay, I'm going to skip that slide and just show you now that we can do this across, be beginning to be able to do this across the entire Western Hemisphere. This is a, another species of thrush. You can see that it winters mainly in the Andes of Western South America. Uh, and in April, it begins to move up Central America and breeding across all of North America. We're now looking at the heartbeat of the natural annual cycle of this species. And we can do this for every species of bird, uh, little by little. We're now beginning to tackle the, the uh, there are enough data beginning to come in from South America that we can actually do the same thing for birds like the fork-tailed flycatcher that breed only within the tropics. So we're looking at the austral migration, the breeding zone in Argentina and Brazil, on up to the wintering zones up in the Llanos of uh, Venezuela and back south. Every single bird species has a story. We've never been able to see stories in this detail before. And it's a consequence of you, the army, putting the information in. Uh, you've now seen individual bird stories. I'm going to show you a plot where every one of these dots actually represents the center of the distribution of a whole species. So you're looking at 128 species of birds in January. And I'm going to now turn this on, and you're going to watch the annual cycle for the center of these birds as the year progresses, the heartbeat of the Earth's natural cycle. By February, they're already moving northward. Look at the role of the Caribbean during migration of these birds and the role of the Gulf Coast. And then they get up to their breeding zone. Look how short their time is up there. They never really stop moving. The distribution never stops moving. They already begin to move south. By August, they're in full migration zone. Down, down, down they come. Many in the fall go straight across the ocean to South America uh, to get down to their South American wintering zones. Little by little, we can do this for every bird species in the world. And that is, of course, our goal from a conservation standpoint. We need to know these, this sort of information. Now, of course, we haven't done this for any old world species yet. So I'm here to say I'm sorry. We've been concentrating on the birds for which we have the most data, of course, the North American breeding birds. Our goal, and one of my main messages to you here today, is to be working hand in hand with collaborators in countries in the old world and in South America to be doing extensively uh, models of this kind for your species. I just popped in and said, let's ask eBird for the distributions of a bird like the great reed warbler in the summertime. This is uh, summer, the summer two months, and here is that species in the wintertime. So clearly we can see that there's enough information in eBird itself to begin doing that same kind of modeling for birds of the old world. We are now beginning to ask a very important question about eBird data, which is can we use it to measure trends? And of course, from a conservation standpoint, that's the key. What are the trends? This is, again, the annual cycle of the now familiar wood thrush, the breeding zone in the north, coming down to this very small wintering zone in the tropics. Imagine, by the way, why we're paying so much attention at the lab. We're investing enormously in partnerships down here at the uh, southern end of the Yucatan Peninsula because it's such an important place for the migratory birds that breed there. And we've asked the question now for the first time statistically over the past 10 years, do we see signs of population change and ominously, the answer is yes. The wood thrush in eBird data is showing signs of 1% to 2% annual decline still to this day in the eBird data. Um, importantly, we can actually ask that question. Uh, we can ask that question at individual places around the range of the bird to see if we can find out where the bird is disappearing most rapidly. Uh, in the case of uh, this example, the uh, central Appalachians, which are the heart of the breeding range of this bird, they are basically stable. It ter turns out it's the periphery of the populations that the uh, declines are most uh, noticeable. So we're learning little by little uh, the biological details of these species um, uh, as, as we go. 
We can also ask questions about the migratory stopover spots. This is again wood thrush uh, looking at its wintering zone and its breeding zone. But here's a plot of the migratory uh, period for wood thrush. And we can zoom in uh, closely to, one, to some of these spots and just zoom ever more closely down and actually locate the individual tracts of land that are most important for this bird during the migratory stopover period. Clearly something that could be extremely important and useful for places like Israel that are so vital for large-scale continental movements of birds. This is not working. So. Um, we are also aware that the eBird data, because we know exactly where the points are put, we can actually go in to the data. This is pretty well stopped working, although this pointer still works, so I'm going to keep using it. Right. Um, what this graph, uh, what the slide shows is a different kind of data. We're going into a spot there and asking questions about the habitats used by those birds. And in the case of the wood thrush, it's pretty simple. During the breeding season, May, June, July, August, that bird is a bird of the fo deciduous forests. But interestingly, down here, especially in the south, as you get to September, October, November, this purple area appears, and that's urban landscapes. Urban landscapes during migration, during the fall migration period. And uh, so what we've... I can't take this. What's my time, by the way? Okay. Yeah. I want to just mention, you just saw the evidence that wood thrushes have a huge... Uh, um, tendency to favor urban habitats during their migration. We have work done recently using this human-caused experiment, the enormous uh, tribute to the 2001, September 11, 2001 uh, tragedy in New York City. There's a, every year on September 11th, there's this uh, tribute in lights in which they send huge beams of light up to the sky at the site of the World Trade Center uh, catastrophe. And as those lights get turned on, it being September, um, okay, pointer, yeah, those dots you see are birds. Birds are attracted to the lights. There, every dot you see in that image is a bird flying around milling around, basically disoriented in those beams of lights. There are over a thousand birds in that one image, and we now have the uh, relationship with the tribute of light that when the image gets up over a thousand birds, they turn the lights off. And we've recently published a paper that shows what the birds do when the lights get turned off, and it was revealing. Every time the lights get turned off, that is the dark zones, the numbers go down. Turn the lights back on, the numbers go back up. Turn the lights off, the numbers go down. We know because of the way the Doppler radar works that those birds have left, and those are new birds coming in. Every one of these peaks is a new population of birds coming into those beams of light. The first true experimental demonstration in nature of how attractive steady beams of light are to birds as they're migrating south a real problem uh, in the, from the standpoint of con conserving species. My final story uh, is to talk about the fact that we're now looking at, remember the uh, wading bird story I talked about with the Yellow Sea? In fact, one of the most important urgent conservation issues facing birds in the world is that almost all migratory shorebird wading bird populations are declining. So we have a special concentration on the wading bird story and this is uh, beginning to sh uh, show where birds like greater yellow legs uh, spend. Of course, we know they breed in the, uh, in the high Arctic. And we're looking at the spots along the migratory pathways and on the wintering zones where they depend on for wintering uh, survival. This is a different species, spotted sandpiper. Doesn't go as far south as the yellow legs, but shows you the same thing. And it shows you how small their wintering ranges are and how, all, therefore, how urgent it is to be paying attention to those exact spots. 
We can use this then to identify the key places in space uh, that are uh, holding uh, various populations. This is just for any species. This is asking questions for the entire shorebird group. Where are they spending time? And we can zero in smaller and smaller scale to actually locate the spots. Thank you, perfect, that's perfect. Three minutes, I've got it. We can use these data then to ask questions about time. Where are the places in their life history that they are most concentrated? Which is gonna mean that we most attend to their, uh, to their pr protection. Uh, and so ultimately, all of this, all of this goes black when my time is up. <laughs> my most important point of all for you and for all of us is that the common birds are telling us the information that we need. Our job is to have a new relationship with the earth. Let the common birds tell us what's going on. Let the common birds give us information about how we can change our behavior. This is the place I get to look at in my backyard in Ithaca, New York. It looks like this over the next few weeks. But don't look at this as my place. Think about your place because every one of you has a place. Everybody has a place. And if we have the idea that we invest a little time in our places and put the information we're seeing at our places into a common database, we have the opportunity to do something at the scale of the planet, the place we came from, the only place we have to live for many of us, our house of worship, it is possible that we will use this tool the first time we can ever do this in the history of humankind. We can use this tool and the power of birds to figure out how we can fit in with all of this grandeur. Thank you very much. <laughs>